Hello and welcome to Spread Book Joy. Today I'm going to be doing two things. I'm going to be reviewing the wonderful Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell and I'm also going to be taking a quiz to find out which Victorian lady embodies my personality. If you're new to the channel, I'm Jack. If you're not new, welcome back to Spread Book Joy. And today I'm going to be doing two things, like I said, as part of my Victober TBR. I read Cranford. I buddy read it with the wonderful Claudia from Spencer's Library. We had a lot of fun and we actually really both enjoyed Cranford. Uh, she's got a review video already out at the time of me filming this. It came out yesterday. I'm going to link it in my description box. I haven't watched it yet because uh, I'm sure Claudia's review is going to be eloquent and very analytical and uh, I urge you to go over and watch it after you watch my rambling nonsense and my attempt to wrap up my thoughts on Cranford. So the other thing I'm going to do is take a Victorian, uh, a late, it's not a Victorian quiz, <laughs> it's an online quiz about just a bit of fun to see which Victorian lady I am most like uh, and that's because one of the big things about Cranford is it's about women. I'm going to also link some really excellent videos that I've watched recently uh, about women in Victorian literature, one by Katie from Books and Things, and the other is a review of The Romance of the Shop uh, by Tilly from Tilly's Shelf, which I thought was excellent, and after reading Cranford is something I'm really interested in reading. I think it was a book that was recommended by Katie as part of her um, uh, recommendations for Victober. Cranford is the first Elizabeth Gaskell book I've ever read and I it won't be my last. I really thoroughly enjoyed Cranford. It's a, a slow, gentle, domestic novel uh, set in the countryside in a small town of Cranford and we follow the lives of the women there and Cranford is an unusual town in that it is m mainly women that live there, live there alone. But Cranford is kind of like a nostalgic look back at small town rural life in the north of England outside of a larger industrial town called Drumble, I believe. And Drumble is based on Manchester, I'm assuming, a um, large industrial town where lots of the men, women who are married in Cranford, uh, their men go off to work there and they stay there. Uh, there are lots of spinsters in Cranford and there are uh, widows as well. So Cranford is an unusual town in that it's mainly made up of uh, female residents and they rub along together quite well. They've known each other their whole lives, a lot of the people there. And the narrator of the story is a young woman who we learn very little about in the beginning of the book, who has spent a lot of time in her youth in Cranford, whose family are friends with the main two characters at the start of the book, who are two elderly spinsters. The two sisters are called Miss Jenkins, Miss Deborah Jenkins and Miss Matilda Jenkins, who's also known as Miss Matty. And these two ladies are the daughters of the former rector of Cranford. So they hold a position of a lot of respect within the village. There's a host of other ladies there uh, and they all have a very distinct social rank within the town of Cranford, within the village of Cranford. These are gentlewomen, so they are gentility, so they're considered respectable and um, they're not considered you know, working class or even middle class, I don't think, but they're considered gentility, but they're probably the lowest rung financially and socially of the gentle classes. So they are not rich people and quite a lot of the time they're really struggling to get by on a very meagre income but because of politeness because of social custom it is crude talk about money and no one in Cranford would ever ostentatiously show they have money because they don't actually have any but they would never even talk about it it would be considered vulgar to um, talk about money or to talk about being poor uh, but yet when they have their social gatherings and things like that they um, will only ever serve really plain food because only someone vulgar would serve something um, extravagant but actually it's just because they don't have any money and politeness dictates that they don't talk about it and they'll walk of an evening home rather than get a carriage because keeping a carriage in those days was a sign of wealth and but these ladies they don't not take carriages because they don't have the money they like to take the air or they like to look at the stars so everything is um, dictated by this real really strict 
uh, etiquette and decorum around money, around social status, around standing, social standing, too much hilarity. So the narrator gently teases and makes fun of the inhabitants of Cranford but in a really fond way. It's clear that she's fond of the inhabitants, it's clear that she's got a lot of love for them and she tells these ridiculous stories about different ways in which they try and save money or they try and save face. There's one particular story that stuck in my mind which I thought was really hilarious where um, a character it invited several of the women who are quite a significant social ranking above her to her house and when they arrive at the door they knock on the door and they hear the woman telling the servant wait until I've gone up the stairs and then she they hear her running up the stairs and then they hear a big loud cough from up the stairs <clears throat> clearly the signal to let them in and then they're let in and then they're all pretending they haven't heard this so Cranford is full of delightful humorous scenes like that one daily domestic details of life what they ate when they ate it when they go to the shops what their lives were like and i found it really immersive and wonderful claudia as an historian she found it extremely um enlightening and she thought it was a wonderful text and actually it kind of brings you back to that time and and the day-to-day -day, the minutiae of daily living which i really really enjoyed so there's lots of cozy domesticity going on in this book and also what i found is it made me connect with the victorians uh, because some of the things that they do and the habits that the narrator talks about and the things that they do um, so for instance they talk about at one point the different frugal habits that certain ladies have and the narrator talks about that and about someone's habit of you know collecting rubber bands or collecting these things because they're precious and actually it makes you think of all the things that you keep just in case you might need them so there were these little moments where I felt really connected to the Victorians because they were people just like us they had their their daily um rituals their little habits their their strange ways as well i think we've all got them and, and i just found it really delightful but cranford is not all humor and daily just daily domestic life there is tragedy in cranford uh, tragedy scattered throughout and it kind of felt as if I felt, I felt it was like watching a modern day TV show and Claudia likened it to a soap opera and I agree with her. It kind of reminded me of, you know, moments of everyday life and domestic details and humour interspersed with actual real tragedy that happens in everybody's lives. And it, when the tragic moments happen, they hit really hard. Um, and the first few that happened actually shocked me quite a bit because I didn't know anything about Cranford going into it. I remember there was a TV show some years back and I think I watched it and I feel like I watched it and enjoyed it, but I have no real memories of it. So um, this was a I went into this completely blind. When you buy a classic, the introduction is something you should never read unless you want the story spoiled for you because the introduction uh, assumes for some reason that you'll have read the story. Uh, it's a really annoying habit of publishers of classics that they do that because you, just because it's a classic doesn't mean we want to have the story spoiled for us. So, you know, if you're anyone that's out there is new to reading classics, never read the introduction first, just go straight into the story and go back and read the introduction when you're finished and you'll get a lot out of it, I'm sure. So, but Penguin Classics have been doing this amazing thing. So if you turn to the introduction, new readers are advised that the introduction makes details of the plot explicit. Now, love it. Spoiler warning at the start of the introduction. If you have this Penguin Classics edition of Cranford, and you don't know the story don't read the blurb because there are some huge spoilers in the blurb uh, this so penguin why go to all that trouble why put a spoiler warning on the introduction and then on the actual blurb the bit that everybody's going to read presumably well, I didn't but <laughs> but a lot of people will read you just go into huge events, huge events, huge spoilers. So that's my little tip for you if you've got the Penguin Classics edition. Gaskell's writing of these tragic scenes actually had me really emotional at certain points. And I did listen to an audio book alongside reading it for certain parts. And 
there was some amazing acting in the audio book. I'll put the name of the audio, uh, the audio narrator on the screen because I can't remember them off the top of my head who mine was, uh, but um, absolutely brilliantly acted and really brought every heartache, every bit of tragedy to life for me and made me really feel for these characters. And that's just a sign of the great writing as well course because no good narrator can uh, make that much emotion out of bad writing. I think Gaskell has a particular skill for small detail and yet also for writing tragedy really well. So Cranford is a love letter to this idyllic English past of small rural towns where life and the industrial age was starting to encroach upon life, everyday life in England. It's also an excellent window into the daily lives of women, particularly spinsters or widows in England. And actually there are several scenes where women's lives and the issues that affect unmarried women or married women, such as child loss, which was prevalent in Victorian England, are discussed in really raw and unexpected detail. And I found that fascinating because rarely do we get a real insight into spinsterhood. And there is a discussion of spinsterhood between um, some of the women about their views on marriage. And they don't all have the same view and take on marriage. One of them is actually quite happy to never have married and is always warning single girls off of marriage. Another is kind of has the middle ground. So we get these other views of marriage from unmarried women that you never seem to get, or at least I've not encountered yet. Uh, not that I've read a huge amount of classics, but I've not encountered these views of marriage uh, being spoken so openly um, out of the mouths of uh, Victorian characters. And there's also a really in-depth, heart-wrenching discussion by a woman who has lost several children. And child loss must have been such a common thing for Victorian women, heartbreaking, but yet because it was so common, it was almost not spoken about or not raised as an issue. Um, and this book, I think, was quite quite a raw look at how it's affected um, one particular woman. So a lot of big themes, a lot of big ideas explored, social themes, gender issues, and things that affect women in their day-to-day -day lives, as well as the small everyday domestic details. Cranford is structured as a series of vignettes. It was published in front of Charles Dickens's magazines, magazines I believe, serialised, and so it would have been published um, month to month or quarter to quarter or however frequently the um, magazine was published. And so each of the stories, they do refer back to things that have happened in previous stories, but they don't run on necessarily in a neat chronology or um, from character to character. We, we get different stories all around the inhabitants of Cranford. There is a couple of themes and threads that run through right to the end, um, but I won't tell you what they are because spoilers. But I just really enjoyed spending time in Cranford and I was sad to leave it when it finished. This particular edition of Cranford also has a few appendices such as fashion in Cranford. Uh, one of the ways in which the narrator tells us that Cranford is very old fashioned is through fashion. She discusses the styles of the women which are probably about 20 years, maybe more out of date at that time. So uh, there's a, an appendix on um, fashion. There's also um, an appendix which is full of Gaskell's letters to readers of magazines about, I'm assuming, you know, about Cranford. Um, I haven't read them yet, but I want to read them. So I really enjoyed Cranford. Healthy doses of humour interspersed with some real drama and just a lovely, cosy, domesticity about this novel, which I really, really enjoyed. So I wondered then, after reading about all these Victorian women, if there was a quiz where I could find out if I would survive as a Victorian woman or similar. So I did a Google search and I found this. I'm going to leave a link to the description, but this quiz, which Victorian lady embodies your personality? I just thought it might be a fun thing to do as I've been considering women in Victorian England. Question one, where do you see the biggest injustice in the world today? Politics, the healthcare system, foreign relations, immigration policies. Oh my goodness. I'm just going to have to go with politics in general because politics encompasses foreign policy, healthcare, and immigration policies. I'm going to go with politics. Do you have an element of your personality that lends itself to a certain career? I like being in charge. <laughs> no. I'm good at helping people. I have a way with words. 
uh, no, I don't settle for good enough. And so it's either between I'm good at helping people or I don't settle for good enough. And I think it's, I'm gonna go for I'm good at helping people. Do you consider yourself a pioneer? <laughs> um, I'm gonna go for not right now. Let's be aspirational here. <laughs> when you see someone in trouble, what do you do? I tend to jump right in and try to help actually. So put that one in. Who do you look up to in life right now? I'm gonna have to go for, I'm gonna have to go for my mum, aren't I? Who wouldn't go for their mum at this point? I'm gonna go for my mum. Is it easy for you to approach new people and build a friendship? I think I'm gonna go for I can build friendships, but I'm working on the approach part. How much does public speaking freak you out? Not at all. I can hold my own. I want to be good at it, so I practice a lot, and it terrifies me. Well, this is an interesting question, isn't it? Because I'm here talking on YouTube, and what I would say is I recently had to give a best person speech at my brother's wedding because I was best person, or best woman, however you want to call it, and um, I had to give a speech, and I was not as terrified as I would have been had I not started doing YouTube. So being on YouTube has actually helped me um, get over a bit of a fear of public speaking. But as a teacher, you have to speak in public, you have to speak to groups of parents. And as a deputy head, I had to do whole assemblies with hundreds and hundreds of children and parents in. So yeah, I put, I could put, I can hold my own, I think I'm gonna put on there. What's your imagination like? Um, given that I get scared when it's dark, I'm gonna say it runs wild. <laughs> Would you consider yourself someone who worries a lot? I worry about literally everything. Is it easy to make you sad? Oh, it's really easy to make me sad. <laughs> I get upset really easily, I'll cry at the drop of a hat. Not about um, challenges or things like that necessarily, but about sad things. I can even just think of something sad. I cry pretty much every day over something. Things will bring me to tears, will move me to tears quite often. Does art make you feel things or do you just not get it? Um, I'm gonna go, I get some art, but some is a bit much. Do you always need to be busy? I'm gonna say no, I love downtime, even though I'm always busy. When you're presented with a complex problem, how do you go about it? Do you talk with smart people about it? See if I can figure it out on my own? Make a pro con list? Well, hopefully time will take care of it. <laughs> not the last one. I know we've make a pro con list. What are your, this is a really long quiz, oh my gosh. What are your eating habits like? I'm gonna say I like to eat healthy foods with a few treats thrown in. First impressions are important. What do you want yours to be? That I have influence, I can make change, that I'm smart but relatable, don't mess with me. <laughs> I kind of want it to be don't mess with me. No, that would be mean. Um, I can make change. Are you more sympathetic or empathetic? Uh, I can be both. Is your life dictated by rules? Yes, way too many. Is you in your nature to be okay with making mistakes? I actually hate making mistakes, but I'm gonna go with no, but I'm working on it. Um, how will you know when you've made it in life? When my name is on the cover of a book. <laughs> what do you think is the hardest part of making a real difference? A fear of disappointment, the backlash if it fails. Mm, yeah, the backlash. How would you like to get ahead of the competition? With hard work, by being more talented, flattery works, or by being clever? Hard work, because everyone can do hard work, right? Far in the future, how do you want to be remembered? As a generational icon, as a champion for those who can't help themselves, as a head of my time, as someone who brought rights to the unrepresented. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go for as a champion for those who can't help themselves. Oh my goodness, I got Florence Nightingale. <laughs> it says, a pioneer in the nursing field, she helps make hospital conditions better and increase the standards for the nursing profession. She wasn't happy with the way things were and she worked to change them. Sound like you? There's a lot of injustice in this world, but with people like you in it, taking tips from Florence Nightingale, it has a real chance of improving. So there we are. After that ridiculously long quiz, turns out, I'm like Florence Nightingale, who knew? Not me. Um, I'll leave the link to the quiz, the really long quiz, in the description box below if you liked it. And if you liked this rambling review of Cranford and all the other associated nonsense, and you've never been here before, please consider subscribing to my channel. You can click subscribe, you can even ring the notification bell to be warned of any 
future videos that come out. And if you have read Cranford, please leave a comment. Let me know, do you agree with me? How much did you enjoy it or not enjoy it? Um, if you've not read Cranford, do you think you'd like to give it a go? I'd love to hear from you. And hopefully I will see you all again here soon. Bye. Thank you.